<sighs> All right. Hello and welcome to Daily Space. I am your host, Annie Wilson, and yeah, we got a lot of rocket news for you today. So, um, yeah, I have a migraine today. If this runs a little short, it runs a little short, but the goal is to just power through everything, literally just power through. So, yeah, so this is Daily Space, and it's a quick rundown of all that is new in space and astronomy. And because it's Wednesday, and I'm the host, we are going to talk about rockets, because that's what we do on Wednesdays. So, let's get at it, shall we? We shall. All right. So, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please use that star in a circle, purple emote, and yeah, I will answer your questions the best I can. Otherwise, if I don't have the answer, someone in chat will, and it'll be perfect. It'll work. It'll work. We'll make it work. All right. So we had three rockets go up this past week, and the first one, as soon as I get everything set... All right. So the first one was from Rocket Grumman. So... November 2nd at 1.59 p.m. UTC, Ooh. Northrop Grumman launched Cygnus Mission NG-12, that's November Gulf 12, aboard an Ontario's rocket. I know, Tinkerbell. So, yeah. Yeah. You all know what this means. So before we get into the science on board, here's the video of the launch. Those that are wearing headphones, reminder, rocket launches are loud. So here we go. Up, up, up. Yeah, of course it's not starting where I want it to start. So give me one second. So 30, there we go, perfect. 20 seconds until liftoff. Just the last bit of the countdown. T minus 10. Five, four, three, two, one. Performance nominal. Enter performance nominal. Estimated alpha, one degree. BNO3 is open. Engines remain at 100% and steady. Beginning of load release. Power is nominal. Estimated alpha one degree. Engines remain at one percent and steady. Power is nominal. Load release phasing out. The NG three is open. Roughly 100 cents, seconds to Miko. Everything proceeding smoothly, about 100 seconds till main engine cutoff. And I'm going to go uh, ahead. Passing 100,000 feet. 100 feet per second squared. I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. High altitude pitch up at 5 degrees. Um. It was a successful launch, and Cygnus did well, everything did well. It was totally nominal. We love the word nominal. Um, we love the word nominal. Uh, NASA has this on their YouTube channel if you would like to see the full 
hour broadcast, which they talk a little bit before the rocket goes off of what science is on board. And they talk, they cover, I think, literally through uh, payload separation. And that whole process can take a while. So that's why we're just gonna cut it here. Otherwise, we'll be here for quite some time. Anyways, so this Cygnus, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Be good. There we go. This Cygnus uh, was named Alan Bean. And the image you have up on your screen right now is uh, called Preparing to Pull the Plutonium. And this was painted by Alan Bean. And it lives at the International Museum of Art in El Paso, Texas. So, um, yeah, we'll talk about that more about that in a second. Um, Orbital ATK the makers of the Cygnus spacecraft and a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman have a tradition of naming their spacecraft, and the November Gulf 12 mission was no exception. The Cygnus spacecraft for this mission was dubbed the Charlie Sierra Sierra Allen Bean in honor of the recently deceased American astronaut. He died in May of 2018 who aside from being a decorated naval aviator and aeronautical engineer, the fourth human to walk on the moon, commander of the Skylab 3 mission, and an un inductee of several halls of fame and honor societies, was also a prolific artist. Bean resigned from NASA in 1981 to focus on his art, which often included surprising colors in addition of which he said was deliberate. Quote, I had to figure out a way to add color to the moon without ruining it, end quote. Further stating that, quote, if I were a scientist painting the moon, I would paint it gray. I'm an artist, so I can add colors to the moon, end quote. His work also included textured medium produced by, get this, including bits of actual moon dust, pieces of personal Apollo mission patches, which had been heavily soiled with lunar dust, providing him a ready source of that material. And by the application of various implements, such as the very hammer he used to pound the flagpole into the lunar surface and a bronzed moon boot. Bean remarked that he felt personally driven to produce his art and to share it piece by piece with humanity since no other artist from any era had the first hand experience he did. He commented that, quote, I'm the only one who can paint the moon because I'm the only one who knows whether that's right or not, end quote. Prior to his death, Bean was the last surviving Apollo 12 astronaut. So yeah, he, he was amazing. Uh, if you ever have the chance to see any of his art, go. It is definitely very textured and it's amazing. I've had that, I've had that honor and do it, do it. It's worth it. It's worth it. So now, <laughs> do you not want to talk about the cookies on board the ISS? You like cookies. Why are you barking like you don't like cookies on the ISS? Anyways, Despite Puck's protests, we're going to talk about the cookies on the ISS. All right, so we can't not talk about this. <laughs> there, on Cygnus, there was a zero-G oven. This is an image of that zero-G oven developed by NanoRex in partnership with Doubletree by Hilton. And along with the oven, you can see a silicone baking pouch in a tin of raw dough. And this, this all is, is amazing. It's all amazing. Um, included in the cargo aboard the Allen Beam is the first dedicated four food oven designed for use in microgravity made by a company called NanoRex in partnership with Doubletree Hotels. Astronauts and scientists alike are interested in seeing just how the oven will perform when paired with Doubletree's signature cookie dough in upcoming experiments. This dough has been waiting in the freezer aboard the ISS since the CRS-18 mission arrived this past summer. So yeah, the astronauts have had cookie dough on board in the freezer and they haven't touched it. I'm kind of amazed by that. So the zero G 
kitchen space oven does not depend on the force of gravity, which stimulates the convection that is so vital to cooking with an oven on, on Earth. Instead, it will use several evenly distributed heating elements, which will work together like a toaster to produce evenly radiated heat. This in turn requires that whatever is to be cooked must be held in place somehow. And the Texas-based NanoRex designed a specialized silicone pouch for this task. Each of these pouches are clear to allow visibility of the contents and have a pair of 40 micron filters to allow hot gases and steam and hopefully that fresh cookie scent to escape while keeping any possible crumbs from escaping. The module in is installed in the Kibo module of the ISS and is equipped with sample trays and cooling racks to finish out this process. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, um, this is a pretty cool experiment. Charlie in H2O uh, says, anyone care to calculate the price per cookie, including launch costs? I'm guessing at least 10K. So our instro has a few more notes on this slide. And yeah, so sorry, Puck's getting into something. As this oven is only a test bed designed to show the feasibility of such activities in space and to allow scientists to observe the results of its operation, the scale is small. Only one cookie can be baked at a time at a temperature of about 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which on my oven is when I press bake and then start for preheat. And there are only five cookies, five cookies in the ISS freezer. There is more bad news. The initial results will not be eaten as they are due to be sent back to Earth for, for analysis by scientists. These samples will help them determine the physics and chemistry unique to cooking in microgravity environment, which will hopefully allow larger, more versatile ovens to be designed and used in the future and answer once and for all the age old question of how slash whether baked cookies rise in microgravity and what they look like if they do. So there's good news to this. Future batches are scheduled for launch every quarter going forward. And since there are five samples in this first uh, batch, our instro heard that only three are needed to be sent back for testing. So they can have maybe two cookies for like three to six people on board. Two cookies. So yeah, um, yeah. There are crumbs in cookies, as some of you in chat are pointing out. And uh, Larry asks, is this a crumb-free recipe? I don't know. I don't know. Veronica Cure asks, uh, or states, the ISS is going to smell like cookies they can't eat. Who designed this torture? I don't know. I don't know. Future, future launches, they'll get cookies in the future. And I think they can only have two of these cookies. So yeah, yeah. Um, the gem doctor says, please don't tell me they have to give up the wine too. There's wine? Since when? <sighs> oh my goodness. So I'm going to scroll up. Broken Symmetry says one cookie's going to get, quote, lost, end quote. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Limp Rimble says heating elements equals light bulbs. I think my sister had one of those ovens when she was a kid. I don't know what the heating elements are made of on the inside. I do know the inside is a cylinder and the uh, cookie, which is in this blue bordered, um, I don't know, the blue bordered thing with the silicone mashed into it. That's just, it slides right into a notch in there and that's how they do the, uh, get the heat all around. So yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Cookie discs. I don't, we don't know how they're going to rise. We don't know how they're going to behave. I'm curious to see all of this out and I'm hoping that we can get, um, 
I'm hoping we could get results from this. So, or not that we get results. We're going to get results. Scientists are going to get results from this cookie oven. But I'm hoping they are going to uh, release this in a very public manner because we need to know. Earthlings need to know if we can bake chocolate chip cookies in space. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's one of the many science experiments on board the Cygnus, but this is the only one that we're all interested about. So, uh, yeah. Rigel says, so astronauts, how was the cookie? They were nom 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 nominal. Yes. Yes. Rigel wins the internet today. All right. On to the next story. Okay, so next up. China had a busy couple of days with not one, but two launches. Uh, the first Chinese launch was November 3rd at 3.22 a.m. UTC when a Long March rocket took the last Gao Fen mission to space. There are also three testbed co-passengers. Um, and we're, we all know I'm going to slaughter the pronunciation of these, so we're going to go with Hangpu-1, Sudan Scientific Experimental Satellite-1, and Zhao Zhang-108. So, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I really need to work on my Chinese pronunciation. Wangpu-1, a technology demonstration satellite developed by Shanghai Institute of Satellite Engineering for a planned constellation of low Earth orbit satellites was... Um, was on board. We know little about it other than that. We know it was on board. We know it launched. That's it. Sudan um, scientific experimental satellite is, you guessed it, an experimental satellite from Sudan. It is the very first satellite for the country to be launched. So that's pretty cool. Um, and do, 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 do. I'm not sure what all of this has to go to. Oh, here it is. So the same satellite. Uh, it's a Chinese made Earth observation satellite developed in partnership with the Sudanese government in effort to modernize the country's struggling economy. The Sudan Institute of Space Research and Aerospace was created in 2003 and this launch was part of that program that continues despite the military backed ouster of the leader responsible back in 2018 speaks for the benefit of the program is perceived to be capable of bringing to the African nation. Other goals of the launch of the of a Sudan owned communications satellite. Oh, other goals include the launch of Sudan owned communication satellite and development of various space based industry. They were partners in last April's launch of Arabsat 6 Alpha by SpaceX, which was sent aboard a Falcon Heavy rocket, with Sudatel, which is a state-owned communications company owning four Kilo Alpha band transponders aboard that satellite. Um, and I don't, I think that's it for this slide. So, oh, here we go. So here is an image of the launch. It was a daytime launch. So the largest payload on board and the primary mission of the launch was the Gao Fen 7 Earth observation satellites. Chinese officials have publicly proclaimed the launch's success and US, <laughs> US military tracking indicates the satellite is now in a near circular orbit, approximately 500 kilometers up for Americans, that's 310 miles. With the orbital inclination of 97.5 degrees to the equator, just enough to retrograde to counteract the tug of Earth's gravity due to its rotation, we can call this what it is, a good sun-synchronous orbit. The Gao Fen 7 is the latest in a constellation of civilian accessible, high resolution sub, sub one meter Earth imaging satellites which is part of the China High Resolution Earth Observation System, developed by the China Academy of Space Technology, which is a state-owned civilian contractor. The Gao Fen have been launching in support of Charlie Hotel 
echo Oscar Sierra since 2013 in China. Chinese officials have previously released several images taken by these satellites. They've also released the specifications of a number of previous Gaofen satellites prior to launch. However, this was not done for the Gaofen 7. According to a Chinese news agency, the primary customer for Gaofen and the Charlie Hotel Echo Oscar Sierra imagery are the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development, and the National Bureau of Statistics. <gasps> Oof. Okay. All right. We have more on the payloads before we get to, you know, the good stuff. So another payload was also called the Dianfeng. It is that Zhao Zhang 108. This is a six unit CubeSat built by Spacity. I'm not joking. Spacity Company Limited, a privately owned Chinese small sat manufacturer. However, in an unusual East West partnership, the Chinese sat maker paired up with the French company ThrustMe. Literally, that's the name of the company, is ThrustMe to have the latter provide one of its kind propulsion system called the India 2 Tango 5, which uses cold gas, non-pressurized solid iodine for fuel. In this case, a solid block of iodine is heated via electric elements and in the unpressurized vacuum, some of that subliminates. Sublimination just means going directly from solid to gas without going to a liquid. Uh, subliminates into a pressurized vapor, which is then used as thrust. The technical difficulty lie, or quote, the technical difficulty lies in controlling the rate of iodine injected in gaseous form to get the proper thrust. Um, however, or end quote, says Godier Brunet, the director of operations at ThrustMe, as he discussed the technical hurdles involved in producing the new design. However, there is significant motivation to do so. Quote, xenon is almost 100 times more expensive than iodine, end quote, says Brene, referring to a rare noble gas that is often used in other electrical or ion thrusters, an industry thrust to me is also part of. In addition, iodine is not flammable and does not require an oxidizer for this type of thruster. The test model is expected to allow... Um, the, oh my goodness, I need to work on my Chinese pronunciation. Uh, Zhao Zheng, attitude and orientation control, but is not yet strong enough to allow orbital changes. That may come later as the company has plans to upscale this design if it's successful and is also working on an iodine fueled ion drive. The company hopes these will extend the lives of future microsets, making them more versatile and survivable during their lives and eventually allow for the Planned controlled deorbits as well. <sighs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, this is a very beautiful picture. Um, <laughs> and I'm watching all of the jokes in, in Twitch chat, and it it makes me it it, it makes me smile. All right, so now that we're done <laughs> with thrust me in spacity. <laughs> We're going to move on to, you know, the launch footage and other things about this launch because there's a whole lot of cool stuff happening with this very particular launch. Here is the launch patch for this particular launch. You can see the cask, Charlie Z-4 Bravo, Yankee 38. So Charlie Z-4 Bravo is the short and international accepted uh designation for a long march for bravo we say i say long march because it's easier than saying whatever the charlie Z stands for and we all know my chinese pronunciation is not very good so on this patch you can see four grid fins and this is important and we'll talk about it in a second and this is the four first long march for bravo with grid fins so uh stagen ass who designed this? I have no idea. And Hanny's asked about the iodine. What is the freezing point of iodine? I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all. So, um, here we have a close up, and it's kind of tricky to see. Let me see if I can get out my laser pointer. 
But this red box is trying to highlight the grid fins on this rocket. And you can kind of see one here profile and there's another one here and this one in the middle is probably one of the hardest to see but this image is literally just uh pointing out where the grid fins are on this uh rocket so up uh, broken symmetry says it's the grid fin doors i'm not sure if the grid fins have doors or not to protect them during launch this is a picture of the grid fins uh, extended on the outside of the rocket with humans for scale. And, and finally, the thing you've all been waiting for, the launch video. So, um, reminder, rocket launches are loud. I'm not saving your ears. It's gonna have some pre-roll of a few other things. This is one of the payloads with the uh, solar panels extended. It's probably the Galfen 7, which was the largest payload on this. There it goes. And some more information on the satellite. It is essentially going to produce uh, 3D imaging. By the submeter level, mean that the point of accuracy is a meter, which is actually pretty good. It's actually pretty good. Um, Larry asks, grid fins, reusable rocket? This particular rocket was not reusable. And RefsMat asks, is there a landing video? I did see a landing video. I did not capture it. Um, but landing videos exist. I do have an image of re-entry. So here is, once I get Google to, to perform, here is, and again, hard to see, this is a still capture from re-entry. And this line right here is of one of the stages with the grid fins coming down in a very straight line. And this blob over here like I said, not a very good picture, but this blob over here is a military helicopter, and these are mountains. So the fact that the military helicopter is nearby um, means that they probably got their target right. Launch Stuff on Twitter, which is where I got this image from, reports that, quote, the goal of the grid fins on the old vehicle is to shrink the smashdown zone for safety and give valuable data to scientists working on the new generation of reusable vehicles. So this is not reusable yet, but they're working on it. This is one of the steps they're taking, which, you know, to be fair, they probably have all of these solid rockets ready and good to go, and making these small changes allows them to make incremental steps towards reusable and in the meantime smashing the uh or shrinking down the smash smash down zone and one of the favorite things i know you all like of chinese launches is looking at the launch debris here's a picture of definitely part of the rocket uh paranor asks no more squish cows yes i'm hoping smaller smash down means no more squish cows no more buildings damaged, no fatalities of any kind, no injuries of any kind, literally making it easier to, um, literally making it easier to recover the debris. And here is a rocket engine with a whole bunch of people around it. So this is not unusual to have rocket debris on the ground for China. It, it's just one of those things. They launch pretty far inland for security reasons. So instead of their bits of debris falling into the ocean, it lands on land. So yeah. <laughs> finding images of debris, finding any debris is not uncommon. And as you can see, people literally um, go and 
find this stuff. So, next up, um, also on the same morning of October, or not October, excuse me, November 4th, uh, the Charlie Sierra Tango 100 Starliner performed a pad abort test out at the White Sands Test Range. This was done as part of the testing program. Uh, the NASA testing program, the NASA commercial crew testing program, which is intended to produce the next generation of American made space vehicles, uh, capable of sending humans to earth orbit and beyond something which NASA has been unable to do since the retirement of the space shuttle fleet. And I'm guessing this is a video. Oh no, it's a really long video. And I guess that's the animation. All right, so we're just gonna have to scroll through. Well, good morning. Jeff Bertelson, I who don't is have our... any. Actually, used the exact same stand. Notes of exactly so where. It's gonna shoot off that path. Sequence, uh, and that's, that's an the animation. What we do is we. Oops. There we go. Lift off. Roll complete. How about you cut off? On track. Format cut off. Pitcher on. 40 kill parachute. Broke parachute's main. SM7. I'm guessing the part attached to the parachute is where humans would be. It does not look very big. Okay, so the service module. Rigel says that looks like a very high G ride. It would be. This is not, you know, meant to be comfortable. It's meant to be you know, to keep you alive. Hanny says, there's a lot of nasty looking orange stuff. Is that safe? I have no idea. I like the airbags. Oh, that nasty looking orange stuff over there? That's probably, um... John Drulun says it's a hydro hydroxine cloud? All right. Um, well, we have Starliner taking to flight for the very first yeah, you, time and touch. It's touch probably hydrazine, on the, desert the dimethyl. Um, uh, that was just unsymmetrical incredible. dimethyl hydrazine. To get a little bit and the over here, just watching it. But that was that was oxygen, phenomenal. Initial indication tetra, is that we've had a very successful nitride? pad test today. Or is it nitrogen right. tetra? No, nitrogen well, tetra off, oxide because saying, nitrogen tetra oxide. Is what turns red. Six seconds later, <laughs> rumble across the desert floor as Starliner is already streaking through the sky. Absolutely, and to see it touch down like that. Now you did see touch down under two good mains, um, which is is certainly within the bounds of the acceptable uh, uh, acceptable bounds for this particular test. We have tested with two good mains and qualification, and that is acceptable for our landing sequence. Um, so this was just incredible. It was incredible to watch this test, uh, and it was just absolutely unbelievable. We're going to take a, just a little look at a replay here. Uh, again, I hope you didn't blink, uh, because 650 miles an hour in five seconds, uh, that thing sure did shoot off its... Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um... Make that behave again. Okay. Oof. All right, so... <laughs> Cheerios. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, somebody started a vehicle up outside. I'm not joking. All right. So here's an image of a touchdown with some of that nasty orange cloud off to the, the corner. 
So at 9.15, I'm going to assume that's a.m. and maybe local time, some 15 minutes into the planned test window, Boeing's CST-100 Starliner was sent the command to execute its launch abort sequence, triggering a short but eventful 78 flight sequence through the clear morning sky to a controlled landing on the floor of the New Mexico desert. The test was designed to simulate a situation in which the test in which the vehicle needs to quickly escape from a potentially hazardous situation while still on the ground. Um, the four launch abort engines and the 12 orbital maneuvering engines were simultaneously triggered, producing about, wow, 800,000 newtons. For Americans, that's 180,000 pounds of thrust. Astronauts in and equipment inside the capsule would have experienced roughly five Gs for 5.1 seconds on their way to the top speed of well over a thousand kilometers per mile. Uh, so 650 miles per hour and a maximum altitude of 1,350 meters or 4,430 feet. So 4,430 feet. Wow. At this time, less than 20 seconds into flight, the thruster pulsed open once again, causing the craft to flip into a tail-first attitude, allowing the three drogue chutes to deploy, they did, which in turn allows for the mains to follow, keeping the craft stable for the separation of the service module, which was that silvery thingy, to drop free at about uh, T plus 35 seconds. During the test though, it quickly became clear that only two of the three main chutes had deployed, these were sufficient to guide the craft to a soft landing atop airbags, which were inflated according, according to plan around the bottom of the vehicle. And NASA and Boeing were quick to announce that this would have been an acceptable result in an actual emergency. Uh, according to a NASA statement on the chutes, Boeing CST-100 Starliner spacecraft completed a critical safety milestone on Monday, in an end-to-end -end test of its abort system, although designed with three parachutes, two openings is acceptable for test parameters and crew safety. After one minute, the heat shield, which was the second thing that we saw, was released, airbags inflated, and the Starliner eased to the ground beneath its parachutes. <sighs> okay, so also concerning to some observers was the large plume of reddish-orange smoke seen as clearing from the uh, service module after it crashed. Uh, all 18 thrusters on the Starliner are powered by that um, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and dinitrogen tetraoxide mixture, and there's speculation that this might complicate an actual recovery operation. However, some experts noted that during actual launch operations, the service module is likely to end up in the ocean while the Starliner steers back towards land. An ocean impact is expected to largely negate the type of fire seen when it crashes into the ground on Monday, largely due to the com two components mixing readily with water, dispersing and decomposing without producing the large hazardous plume of smoke. Oof, oof, oof. Um, Hanny's asked, did they have crash, crash astronauts aboard with sensors and stuff? I imagine they had something to capture uh, the forces. Um, Veronica asks, would three parachutes have decreased the amount of G-force, uh, experience? Um, Arnstro answers with, not during the burn phase, and John Dura add, no, only impact force. Larry Weird asks, will the di, uh, will the two components, the unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and the dinitrogen tetraoxide mixture, kill fish and dolphins? One of the two can be hazardous to, uh, to uh, amphibious and aqueous life, um, but if you dilute it enough, remember the it's the dose that makes the poison. So if it's diluted enough, it won't be enough to harm anything. And our instro adds only if they're right where the service module lands, and both chemicals are in store as that both chemicals break down rapidly in sunlight and water. So it should dilute quickly. It should dissolve quickly, you know, with moisture as John wrote Loon um, and Hanny's, Hanny's Vorswerp. 
ads. Blah. Um, yeah, we, we know this is nasty stuff. We know we don't want to be anywhere near it. So, yeah. All right. I'm going to move on to the second Chinese launch. So the second Chinese launch happened on Monday, November 4th. It was a very busy day on November 4th. Uh, 5.43 p.m. UTC when the Beidou 3 India Tree Quebec mission took off aboard a Long March 3 Bravo rocket. This particular Beidou satellite is destined for an incline geosynchronous orbit. What that means is instead of satellite appearing to stay in one spot from the ground, it will appear to trace out a figure eight also known as an lemma in the sky. There are already 11 other Beidou satellites in orbit um, in this particular orbit, uh, type of orbit, excuse me, but only two in this particular inclined geosynchronous orbital slot having 55 degrees inclination. So what's the benefit of this type of orbit? The highly inclined orbit means that the, at northernmost the satellite appears to be near directly overhead from most places in china for several hours if you have say three of these in the same orbit then at various times a day each one will be over that spot near the zenith this position information can then be programmed into the satellite signals informing user terminals that this particular signal from this particular satellite which observes itself in a particular orbital position um so yeah it's it's pretty cool um oh and somebody's saying big dipper star pattern on the patch this is actually not the patch this is the logo of the beidou navigation satellite system and beidou is what they call the um, great the big dipper so it's it's quite a fitting logo i feel so we have a we have some lunch media. So this was a night lunch and you can see that nasty, nasty uh, red and orange and yellow from the unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine and the dinitrogen tetraoxide oxidizer. Um, yeah. And we have some lunch video. Here is part of the rocket being moved. It's going vertical. I'm not sure what's happening here. Humans putting on the uh, fairing. And here's the actual punch. This one did not have grid fins. And this was the 49th of the Beidou navigation s satellite system. There we go. And, and, cause you know, y'all like debris. Here's an actual video of the debris. It was filmed in vertical, so my apologies. Hmm. How do we do? see some soldiers and it was in some kind of field so yeah that is all I have for you today um, go ahead and ask questions I am going to undock or unbirth the lap dog so give me one second to do that and we'll start um, Yeah, we'll start answering your questions. Our instructor says, all she says. So as a reminder, while you're typing in your questions and then, you know, I scroll up and look for stuff. Uh, we are a production of Planetary Science Institute. And make it rain. 
Uh, Larry asks, are sh champagne jelly beans and tequila good for a headache? Um, the champagne jelly beans are gone and tequila is not good for a headache. And I, th I do think Nightbot has indeed exited the building. So I'm going to scroll up now. I think I did... I think I covered everything. Um, K.A. Band says R and Stro. Yeah, we need to put more pronunciation notes in there. That's just... That's, 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 that's on me. Um, Scrum Dilly says launch from Quarry. I'm not sure if that's where it is. Um, I haven't done too, too much poking around from, uh, to see if it is from a quarry, but if you're saying it looks like a quarry, I'm going to believe you. Uh, Arnstra says I can just say key os for Charlie, <laughs> Charlie Hotel, Echo, Oscar, Sierra. And all of the lewd jokes <laughs> about the French company name and uh yeah yeah um Ernstro adds usually about the iodine being used as a propellant usually we see iodine is a tincture suspended in various solvents such as rubbing alcohol And during one of the Chinese launches, you saw some freezy bits that shook off. Uh, one of the stages does have cryo. It does have cryo. I think it's one of the last stages to be used because the lower stages, the first ones to go off, um, da, 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 do indeed, are indeed that um, toxic middle ground kind of stuff. And as far as um, nitrogen, <coughs> ah, ah, ah. nitrogen tetraoxide versus dinitrogen tetraoxide, I'm going to actually have to look up what the chemists say is correct because um, I think it's assumed if you leave off the dinitrogen, I think it's assumed that um, a good chemist would assume that you're talking about two nitrogen. Um, kind of like how we don't say dihydrogen monoxide when we talk about water. <laughs> All right, things are happening outside, so we're just gonna toss toss Cheerios. Um, Trillion says, guessing the airbags are actually floats, probably better than 50-50 if it lands in water, uh, if it's triggered on a real launch. There is uh, an actual like life raft thingy that kind of goes around it if there is a water landing, but I don't think uh, those are actually, and Arnstar goes on and says, yeah, it's, it's intended to land on land. So those are actually airbags. Um, <coughs> life is hard when you're a dog, apparently. Um, so... Journey started asks, I just got here from being somewhere else. Did they show a mobile, mobile civilian launch that was canceled and rescheduled? So that particular launch, that was the, I'm making a point to not talk about launches until after they happen. Otherwise material can get pretty repetitive. Um, there was a very rare live stream of a Chinese launch. And that was that one on the uh, transporter erector launcher, which, it's just a really big vehicle. And that one was scrubbed, but it has not been 
If it's been rescheduled, it's not one of the two that happened this past week. Uh, these two Chinese launches did kind of sneak up on us. That happens. They're allowed to do that, especially when they're like, okay, this is going to launch no later or no earlier than or no later than uh, like the end of a month. So, um, yeah. Hanny asks, have they thought about making new confections, keeping in mind how space affects baking, like just having round baked goods? That's the point of the cookie oven is to see how, um, is to see how things bake in microgravity. If the cookies perform well, I can imagine seeing biscuits done, but biscuits have a lot of crumbs, which could be problematic. Crumbs on the ISS just aren't good. They do eventually get caught up in filters, but until then they can get into equipment. So, all right, more Cheerios for the dogs. All right, all right. Um, Haney says they need to have a top chef uh, baking challenge up there. Kerbal says SpaceX static fire. Yeah, I, I know there was a static fire. There was a lot to cover, guys. There was a lot to cover. Um, and then something was streamed by Jaxi yesterday. And yes, Veronica, I think everyone does deserve a trophy for not for not actually making a joke about the French project. I am so proud of you all. That was really so so that was that that was it was amazing. Um Broken Symmetry says chocolate chip cookie sphere with an icing satellite. Yeah, that will be interesting because there is no gravity to make the cookie like spread uh like how if you put globs of cookie dough on a tray and you know they'll spread there's no gravity to allow for that so it might just stay in that glob i can also see like if it's done like shortbread cookies are and the, the dough is sliced and um just literally sliced out and then pushed in so it's already flat that could also be an option so um, yeah, yeah. Um, anybody else have any questions? So I know today was long. Ignore that audio. Cookie bites slash spheres. I would not be surprised if it ends up being like cookie bites and spheres. I really wouldn't. Uh, that's just, there's no gravity to flatten them out. So what do you do? Or rather, there's not enough gravity. I shouldn't say that. Just eat cookie dough, no crumbs. Yeah, yeah, there was a whole lot to cover, Myth Town. There was a whole lot to cover. Uh, Arnstro asks, Arm, am I trying to cover the launch tonight? There's a launch tonight? Oh, man. Um, Rocket Launch Live. What is launching tonight? Oh! That's not, there is no launch tonight. I, I don't, what launch is tonight? There's weekly space hangout tonight, says Susie. Broken Symmetry asks, are you feeling a little better or did we tire you out? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty tired. I'm, I'm pretty tired. I, I don't see anything on rocketlaunch.live for a lot a launch a launch tonight Arnstro so yeah yeah so don't eat raw cookie dough and here's why it's not just the eggs that can give you salmonella it's actually the raw flour too so don't eat raw cookie dough if you buy cookie dough that's meant to be eaten um, that's a different thing John Drulun says it's not the gravity that flattens out the cookies, it's the yeast and the temperature settings. Um, you don't add, I don't add yeast to, uh, to chocolate chip cookies. It might be like the baking powder slash baking soda. Uh, it's butter versus things, um, other things. Oh, settling, okay. 
Um, okay, our instructor says, ah, the launch was scheduled for tonight, but then uh, has been delayed. Yeah, uh, yeast is typically used in bread. Uh, baking powder can also be used as a leavening agent. Uh, Raj Luthor asks, are you going to live stream SpaceX's Falcon 9 Block 5 Starlink launch? It You can make cookies with yeast? What? John Derloon, what cookies do you make with yeast? Um, because that's, now I'm kind of curious. Um, am I going to live stream it? Yes, but I'm seeing that it's not happening until November 11th. And that's going to be 9.51 a.m. my time. So let me look at the actual date for that. That's on a Monday. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I make no promises, but I will try to live stream because that just involves me getting up early. Um, now we're all talking about cookies. Yes, I'll, I'll talk the, yeah. Um, and yeah, you can get pasteurized eggs and I'm sure there's a way to do. Oh, the transit in Mercury. Oh my goodness. Is anybody streaming the transit in Mercury across the sun? And Susie adds about cookies. Okay, typical American style cookies don't have yeast. Um, there are likely some sort internationally that do use yeast, probably on the Great British Baking Show at some point. Um, Econ Greg is streaming the Mercury. Uh, Susie's saying Oceanside Telescope might stream the transit. I don't know if Fraser's streaming the transit. Uh, Ref Smat said there's going to be a stream from the Netherlands. I don't have a telescope, plus it's almost always cloudy in Youngstown. So if Econ Greg is streaming, or somebody else is, we'll probably, like, if Econ Greg is, is we'll probably just host Econ Greg. Um, I don't even know when the transit is it. It is, I don't know when the transit is, honestly. Bad Panda Bears is asks, is the transit available or visible from the west coast? I thought it wasn't. I have no idea. Because if it's not visible from the west coast, I don't know if Fraser can actually see it. I can't remember what, what coast he's on. I think he is on the west coast. Um, yeah. I thought it was next Tuesday. Uh, this, this sounds like a Friday conversation. He streams on YouTube, tests on Twitch. Okay. I thought he was on the West Coast. We will figure this out for Friday because I think I'm also hosting Daily Space on Friday. Um, and since it happens on Tuesday, we'll also probably have information about that on Monday. And I might have information on Sunday about that. Um, things and stuff, stuff and things. But seriously, uh, Jean Derlune, uh I am very interested in what cookies you use that you make with uh, yeast because yeah cookies are awesome <laughs> iron heart says i'd love to see a future series of great british bake-off in space i would i would love to see all sorts of baking experiments um happen on the iss and i imagine they are going to happen so yeah okay so yes Frasier is on the West Coast, so Frasier, if it can't be seen on the West Coast, Frasier's not going to stream it. Um, we'll figure it out, and we'll we'll get that info to you. Um, I think that's literally all I, I can handle today. Um, I do have a head, or I, I do have a migraine coming on, and my brain is starting to turn to mush. So I'm going to kind of end it here. Um... Okay, should be able to see it starting at sunrise. Hanny says they need to send up a scientist chef. Astronauts are very interesting people. There must be someone. Um, <laughs> um there are literally people, there are literally scientists, food scientists that study all of this. Oh, DOS is streaming this weekend too. Good, good, awesome. All right. So, 
I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, this has been Daily Space. I have been your host, Annie Wilson. Today's script was written by our instro, otherwise known as Dave Bullard and myself. Uh, we are produced by Susie Murph, who is going to be awesome and do the podcast and all the other things for me later today. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, we are produced, or no, we are production of Planetary Science Institute, located in Tucson, Arizona. And we are brought to you literally by you. So thank you for everything. Thank you for your bits, your subs, your donations, all of it. Thank you. Um, if you can't afford to do any of that, that's fine. It's fine. It, we understand. A good way to support us without spending any money is just tell your friends. Tell anybody. Inflict us on anybody that will listen. And followers are free. So I will see you all later. Uh, Raj S, are you on Twitter? Uh, there is a CosmoQuest account on Twitter. And uh, CosmoQuest is on Twitter, on YouTube. And you can find them both just by searching CosmoQuest X. X is where the science is. And if you're asking if I personally have a Twitter account, yes, I do. Um, look for Binary Ablaze. I mostly tweet about my dogs and my cat. So yeah, it's it, there's not a lot of science there. It's just a lot of random life stuff. Um, yeah, all right. I'm gonna roll the credits. Y'all have been awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful insert time of day here, wherever you are in the world, and keep being awesome to each other. And I will see you all eventually. <laughs> um, again, thank you so much. Bye.